Hey, welcome back to a uh, another video. You can see that I'm still in lockdown, and uh, my hair's getting pretty long, as well as the first uh, starts of a beard. Um, thought I'd be here today to just talk about some books that have influenced me um, in my life. Um, the camera seems like it's going out of focus, so if most of this is out of focus, then. Sorry, um, that's just the way it will be. I hope this um, gives you a bit of an incentive to read, and it also, I hope this also gives me a bit of an incentive to read more. Um, I'm hoping to maybe do this sort of thing every year, where I just go through the books that have been the best, uh, I think, for that year that I've read. Um, and I thought I might as well just start with just going through some of the major books which have influenced how I think over the past 20 years. It will also be kind of getting into some of my like own life um, and it will kind of be looking at the situation I was in and then how that influenced my situation. Obviously there have been many hundreds of things which have influenced me which also haven't been books, there have been many events and I can't include all of them, so this isn't even uh, an essential list of factors in my life either, obviously. Um, but I just think it's interesting, and it's nice, at least in my opinion, <coughs> for me to be able to reflect on just my life so far, in this uh, fifth of a uh, hundred years. I've got 17 books that I want to share, um, yeah, and we'll just get into it, I guess. The second book which has probably influenced my life has probably been, uh, no that isn't Mao Zedong, that's just, uh, yeah, the New Testament, um, because though I've never read it, I went to a Church of England school, and a lot of, obviously, a lot of the morals I picked up when I was younger came from, uh, like, Christianity and, more specifically, the Church of England. Many morals, yeah, such as like living with kind of loving people and forgiving people and uh, always trying to do the good thing and always trying to understand people. I think I've learned a lot of that from my time at Church of England School. Um, and I think it's probably pretty obvious that like those things can still be taught regardless of what institution you're in. Um, for the most part, but, and those same values would have been, you know, uh, propagated by lots of different religions and even secular kind of groups, but at least it had a quite a big influence on me, and it's had a quite a big, yeah, just kind of being sympathetic to others, it's had a big influence on the way uh, I live my life, really. Skipping ahead about seven years or so, we, we kind of go through reading a lot of the Beast Quest uh, series, a lot of the uh, Charlie Higson books, and also quite a few of the uh, Diary of the Wimpy Kid uh, series. And I come to uh, this book, Catch-22, by um, Joseph Heller, right? Yeah. My dad gave me this book, um, and I thought it was pretty daunting at the time because of how thick it was, but it was actually quite a good book. Um, well, obviously it's here because it's influenced my life. I probably read this when I was maybe from like year sort of maybe maybe the end of year eight to year nine and a bit of year ten maybe um, at secondary school. And it was I would usually read it during form time, uh, if any other people from the UK um, are watching this, um, just usually like 20 minutes, maybe just 
just before the last lesson of the day um, and I'd just sit there and read and I really got into it. The book's a very humorous one and it's also one that looks at the absurdity of certain institutions and certain hierarchies um, in those institutions. Uh, it follows some people in the army and it follows how ridiculous many of the situations they got in um, even despite them all following the rules and um, the kind of regulations and stuff in the army and it's funny because they're kind of being serious and it's probably the most reasonable thing to do to act the way they do according to the rules that they're set uh, that's set there and yet that makes it even more ridiculous because they're doing ridiculous things but it's perfectly sensible for them to do these ridiculous things and I think overall it made me sort of take less seriously uh, certain institutions such as the school or the army or whatever um, and it just allowed me yeah, just to kind of see things a little more lightly and be able to like stand back and kind of laugh every now and then. So yeah, I'd uh, just recommend this to anyone who's probably over 14, um, but it can be anyone beyond that really. Probably when I start, when I was starting to finish uh, Catch-22 was when we started reading um, An Inspector Calls um, as part of my English GCSE. We originally read through Animal Farm, but then we had a change of teacher and we had like basically like half a year of just never ending supply teachers and getting nothing done apart from pissing about in lessons um, until we actually got a teacher and then we actually did uh, an inspector calls. The play was sort of like a realization of the morals I'd been holding from uh, like from my um, primary school and essentially kind of bringing them out in a political sense. Um, I often found myself agreeing very much so with the inspector um, and learning also and, and and seeing how the same thoughts that I was having was also the same thoughts that he had and um, it, it like yeah it just kind of made me identify my kind of political convic convictions a bit more because the book actively deals with those types of things and the types of views that we can have on different classes and different people in society. At the time I was really unaware about politics just in general, I didn't really give a damn. Um, I'd heard that my dad would probably vote Labour and my mum would probably vote Conservative but I didn't really know what they meant, I just knew that Labour meant you cared more, and uh, and that was it. it and, and that was as far as my politics went. Um, yeah, so it was hardly any kind of political awake awakening for like anything, but it, it did at least express the values I had um, from from my kind of upbringing. This was also alongside when um, I was. I was also doing um, religious uh, education, um, as I think most kids probably have to do, and well, in the UK at least. And I was starting to kind of develop some kind of sort of view of determinism, um, and so that coincided with that book. And it kind of it was just the start of like an emergence of also philosophical thought um, and how that impacted people in society um, yeah and so I include it because it was essentially like more of a defining point in my life really and also like a slight thing that altered my views and so we skip over some of the parts from GCSEs I read Macbeth, Jekyll and Hyde um, some of the poems for uh, our yeah, for English. Um, I do my religious education, GCSE, uh, and my teacher, and by the way, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. You, you're a great uh, religious uh, teacher, uh, religious education teacher. And he recommends that I, I might like doing religious studies at A-level. And so um, I keep that in mind and then kind of do my GCSEs and they're done. Around year, if we're going back a little bit, around year 10, my friendship group that I was part of started breaking down and that ended horribly. Um, I tried to make some more friends with other people but they they actually ran away from me. Um, and at the time I was just kind of generally sort of like a, a proto-incel in a way. I was, a, as it was called then, like a nice guy. And um, I was also, what well, I guess the kind of sort of modern equivalent would be well, modern, um, it would be something like simp or something. Uh, I generally had very low self-esteem and I just didn't like, life was pretty uh, bad in a way. I did end up making uh, some good friends with some really lovely people, um, except I didn't really, I, I always kept my distance really, I was never fully engaged and I was always kind of a bit more protective in that way. That's no fault of their own. Um, it's just the kind of a, well, the, the experiences I'd had in my life that had led me to kind of be that way. I started also listening to uh, YouTube videos such as the uh, the Eight Bit Philosophy videos that um, Wisecrack used to do, and some of the Wisecrack stuff that they do still now. Um, I was watching, you know, a little bit of the, the School of Life and stuff like that on YouTube. Um, as well as still watching you know, just like something like Minecraft or something, uh, people like Big Star and all those types of things. I also realised that like life didn't really have an inherent meaning and probably for the next three years or something I'd, I'd slowly come to terms with this and uh, eventually like overcome it. Um, and because of that also I'd run into uh, Albert Camus. And his uh, his book *The Plague*, which will come into focus. Yeah, there you go. Quite an interesting cover. Um, this is quite one of the older books. I'd come to borrow this book from a fellow classmate's mum's copy of the book, um, and I uh, I'd read through *The Outsider* before this, and uh, like obviously looked at a little bit of stuff online. Um, YouTube videos about Camus and I never finished the book mostly because um, the copy that I had borrowed from my friend was written in a weird way and well translated in a way which kept all the, the French kind of phrases and like kind of ways they say things and because of that it was really strange to read because it was the English but just kind of organized differently and a lot of the time I'd read it and I would, I wouldn't, I'd like, I'd vaguely get it and then I'd then understand what they're saying. They were just saying it in a French way. And I really enjoyed reading that way because um, it was like just a different way of thinking about how things are done um, and how things are described in stories. And then I had to give that um, borrowed book back and I picked out like a, a different one, um, one like this one and I found that just the writing sucked, in my opinion. Um, it, it didn't say, it didn't explain or describe things the same way as it did in that other translation. And so I just kind of gave up on the book, really. The key thing that I want to, uh, the reason why I included this, though, is because it, it really influenced me, especially how about halfway through the book, the, um, the, proto the protagonist, who's like a doctor, um, He's asked why he's continuing to help treat these people who have the plague. And he he doesn't say it's down to any kind of, you know, it isn't down to any heroic effort. Uh, it isn't because he's an extraordinary, extraordinary person. It's precisely because he is actually really ordinary. And he just sees it as a, just a common decency to just do the right thing. And I think that really kind of changed the way I looked at things because 
we don't all have to be supermen. Um, we just have to just do what's the morally decent thing. And I thought that was really, uh, really sobering in a way, if that's the right word to use. It didn't really influence, well, at least from what I think, I don't think it really influenced the way I acted in any way. Um, it was just something that I remembered. And perhaps it's something that's also allowed me to deal with something like nihilism a bit. Yeah. At this time, I was uh, now kind of in my the start of my first year, or well, first year of uh, A-levels. Um, I had been learning about Camus throughout, like, um, and, and the existentialists kind of throughout, kind of, sort of, mid year 11 to, um, to kind of the start of A-levels. And um, I, as well as doing religious studies, I ended up also doing media and um, uh, psychology. And one book that particularly came into my um, environment was uh, Marshall McLuhan's The Medium is the Message. I was also getting more interested in, uh, well, due to me doing media, I was getting interested in the types of theorists that we're learning about, such as Bar Barthes um, or Baudrillard um, or someone like Paul Gilroy um, or Bell Hooks and Oh yeah, I was just interested in what who these people were, and so I was starting to watch a lot of people like uh, folding ideas, and also then the associated sort of bread tubers um, that are kind of related to those types of people. Um, so I started watching like Philosophy Tube, uh, ContraPoints, Hitch Bomber Guy, rather than watching you know every week or so some kind of feminist gets triggered or whatever I started moving particularly from someone like H bomber guy uh, I particularly saw these things as quite funny to mock and uh, because I was also getting into media I was also watching kind of people like uh, Cuck Philosophy who's now a Jonas Psyker or something um, sorry if I've mispronounced that um, and I was also yeah learning about you know how someone like Jordan Peterson, who I'd been watching occasionally every now and then, um, as well as someone like Alan Watts. Um, I, I realised how, like, uh, Jordan Peterson, though he's probably great at other things, and he certainly helped me out uh, to some degree, not a big degree, but a little bit, um, I was starting to learn that, you know, he didn't really know what he was talking about when he was talking about postmodernism. Or Marxism, really, and I mean, th this was bread tube before it was bread tube, and I, I still wasn't. I was no, by no means like a Marxist, or or I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd even call me myself like a socialist or something. I just knew that like these guys seemed to be saying what I thought was kind of right, and uh, they were pointing out that people who were being a bit ridiculous. Uh, particularly like anti-feminists and I, w I wouldn't have called myself a feminist either I'd have said I was an egalitarianist um, because I, I believe in the equality of the sexes as do feminists but yeah um, so my my viewing things were changing I was, was watching less uh, Vixar123 play uh, Minecraft and, and more people like I don't know Angie Speaks or um, Later on, someone like Peter uh, Griffin, no, Peter Coffin. I was watching a Folding Ideas uh, video that he had done, and I was thinking about, um, well, he brought up how there was the medium as the message, and I didn't know what this meant. And so, I, uh, at the time, I used to work in this kind of shed, and my mum had just finished a... Um, masters in media and communications and so she had bought a whole series of books there are other books like uh like these ones if, uh, if it zooms in or oh, focuses rather 
these were some of the other books that my mum uh, had bought and didn't end up reading any of them but that I essentially just stole them from my mum's bookshelf and put them in my room and uh, they're still waiting to be read at some point uh, and one of them was Marshall McLuhan's The Medium is the Message I include Marshall McLuhan's book though because it's more symbolic of a larger thing firstly because it's, it's an amazing book itself um, it seems large but you can read this just in one sitting and I'm a slow reader but it's because it has all these graphics as well and I just thought that was a really great idea to be able to merge visuals also but with um, information and also changing the way the words are arranged and stuff uh, was really interesting stuff and especially with the whole concept of the book with the the medium or the, the way that information is transmitted being part of the message of the transmitted information anyway I thought it was a really interesting idea um, and and I, I secondly also uh, use this because it's more symbolic of the turn I was making um, in uh, in uh, our religious studies we would learn about Wittgenstein and uh, his ideas about um, well, particularly the later Wittgenstein with his ideas of language games um, and I was also learning about semiotics uh, from people like Roland Barthes and to be able to kind of merge those two and to be able to see okay well you know how does Baudrillard's idea of hyperreality relate to Roland Barthes' ideas of mythology? And then how does uh, Marshall McLuhan's work also in, like, kind of influence that? And then also how is like the idea of language games um, linked to uh, semiotics? And that, that absolutely blew my mind, being able to put those two things together, being able to do media with semiotics and um, my religious studies thing with Wittgenstein and be able to merge them two. And it was just amazing to see the connection between them. And I think that's what's influenced me to then do philosophy at university, just because it was just incredible to be able to put those two, two together and to put these, like, all these concepts and ideas into one seemingly kind of cohesive whole um, about how language is formed and shaped in society and I thought that was just amazing and, and that's probably what's influenced me most to do philosophy at uni if I uh, know no it is it is now we're skipping maybe a little bit later on maybe about maybe a year later maybe or um or maybe six months later, and um, and I, I'm, this is particularly when I was looking around different universities to see where I would go um, to do philosophy. Really, um, most of my kind of political education uh, was coming from YouTube, as it probably is coming from a lot of people, because books are hard and long, and why would I do that when I can just watch? Tom Nicholas explains something, or why would I do that when I can just watch um, Reganade Cut explain something, or why might I just watch uh, uh, Philosophy Tube explain something? And so my um, I was also getting more into kind of kind of politics on YouTube, um, particularly kind of left wing politics, and so I was also kind of being now more exposed to someone like Bad Mouse Productions. Uh, rest in peace's channel now. I was also becoming aware of uh, Aaron um, from Re-Education, his channel, um, and also uh, people like Bad M. Panada, um, because he also he was given a shout out from someone like Fort Slime, um, who had also like start learning about. Someone like Mexi as well, um, starting to watch. And it was around this kind of point where I was like, okay, so I, I have a vague understanding at the time, I thought, you know, I, I knew what these things like socialism or communism or anarchism were. Um, they were very vague and very simple ideas uh, 
for the time really now looking back but I had kind of probably the same thing that a lot of people have where they think okay well yeah sure these things sound cool and all like they sound nice but it's not going to be possible is it I mean if you look at all the times that socialism's been tried it's failed every time so you know it, it's just fantasy it's sure it's nice to think about and um, it's nice to be able to be able to have the correct information about like someone like Marx but, but it's not possible and it was particularly around this time that I came across um, just uh, just two videos by a, a guy whose channel has now been deleted and I I think kind of rather une like uneasily uh, or uh, rather kind of worryingly um, I think he turned into some kind of reactionary or, or I, I don't know but his channel got deleted and it used to be something all I know is that his profile picture used to look a little like that and um, I, can't, I can't remember anything else but but he uploaded a video where looking back it was just that he was taking a couple of Wikipedia articles probably um, and was just pointing out all the things that these uh, kind of so-called state socialist socialist um, governments and also these kind of uh, um, anarchist um, movements and just kind of pointing out actually all the things that they, they did do right stuff like about how the literacy rates in these countries soared about how um, about how their uh, their life expectancy and their, their infant mortality increased and this was really really crazy to hear because it just you know ran contrary to everything I was thinking before um, so that had a huge influence on me and then and another thing that had a huge, influ huge influence on me was uh, this pamphlet it's only you know just a tiny pamphlet but it was one that was talking about well West Kurdistan uh, also known as Rojava uh, by a lot of people and I only bought this for a quid and I bought this from uh, News From Nowhere in uh, Liverpool the weekend I got this uh, this pamphlet sorry um, was one where uh, I went down to look at Liverpool University uh, to see its like philosophy for its open day, um, and it was it was a really nice day. It was a very nice uh, kind of weekend because um, I bought this and um, and I also bought uh, I think uh, I bought um, Society of the Spectacle as well, and I um, I just kind of. It, it was really nice for me and my dad to be able to bond because we ended up um, talking drunkenly about politics in a in a pizza um, place and then uh, just, yeah, spending the night in Liverpool and then going home the next day and uh, it was a really nice bonding time this book particularly influenced well, this pamphlet particularly influenced um, my political journey because it showed how like actually existing attempts to move to a socialist society like we were actually happening I, I'd watched previously a uh, a video by a non-compete um, about Kurdistan um, or no Kurdistan? yeah like um, I'd watched videos by him about like Rojava and I was really like so I had a vague understanding but to be able to read this and see that you know 40 million people live in that area and yet they're still able to kind of they're moving towards a socialist society and on top of that in the midst of wars and and such scarce resources and barren lands they were able to start to build this that really surprised me um, obviously they're not perfect um, no no government or country are perfect no com no country or government or area ever will be perfect um, but it was certainly something you know 
that slapped them around the face and went, oh crap, you know, these things can be possible. I would, uh, I'd also go to Bristol to look at a University of West England to see their philosophy um, kind of thing. And uh, I then end up going into Bristol. And But we're going to get to that a bit later on. Um, but towards the end of um, my second year, there's a parting gift I gave um, Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations to, um, to to one of my friends, and then I thought like I'd want to probably read it as well, and so I, I also got a copy for myself, and um, haven't read through much of it, but the parts that I have read through I think have had an influence on me, and I think Stoicism is probably a very helpful uh, kind of philosophical view. Though I don't think it can be used alone to make both yourself and the world a better place. I think it has to be combined. Still used, but also other things used for a good life. And I want to try and make some videos talking about Stoicism or similar areas to that. Going back, however, um, back to uh, yeah, going to Bristol, I uh, ended up, I was watching particularly someone like Bad Mouse Productions at the time, and he had a video talking about worker co-ops. And I was in Bristol at the time, and he, at the start of it, he talked about some worker co-ops in Bristol. And one of them was the now, uh, I think, um, no longer there, uh, Hydra Books, uh, which was a worker co-op. And the day I went there, I think, was related to um, a meeting that had been held um, I think, talking about um, a bunch of the friends there talking and discussing about the life of uh, Anna Campbell, or Campbell. And uh, Anna Campbell was a um, was a, uh, a British uh, woman who who went to fight in uh, in Rojava um, with the YPJ, I think. Um, and I I wasn't. At the time, I, I wasn't aware of this, really. Um, I was just ecstatic that I was able to find this bookstore and that they had, you know, all of these kind of radical books there. Um, and I ended up buying Capitalist Realism. Uh, this isn't the original copy that I bought. Um, Finn, if you're watching this, give me it back. Yeah, this is a different um, one. But, yeah, they, um, the day I went, I think uh, there was a kind of people coming together to talk about the loss of Anna. And I didn't even realise that at the time. It's only, you know, well, it was only like a year later that I realised. Um, but it was very noble um, and quite inspiring in the way that she went and actively worked for the world that she wanted to live and that's very inspiring um, yeah um, so um, I hope she's resting very much in peace and um, so many good time up there getting back to uh, capitalist realism though um, in the I think it was the second semester of my first year I am um, at university I'm in my second semester of my second year at the moment of the time of recording um, but in my first semester I had to write a um, well I was given the option to choose between many things but I choose uh, to write in my politics module about the relevance of socialism in the 21st century and I chose uh, to write about this book uh, use well using this book as particularly the main kind of main influence really. Um, I used it because I hadn't read through it. I bought it, you know, the year before, but I'd never got round to reading it. I'd heard things about it from channels like Zero Books, um, but I'd also start you know, watching vaguely, not really understanding anything that Douglas Lane was saying, but. You're just kind of having a general idea 
Um, and so I bought it because of that and because I'd heard other people say that was a great book. Um, but then I had to actually obviously write an essay relating to it. And so I actually read through it. And my god, it's only like 80 pages, but those 80 pages are jam, uh, jam-packed full of like so many references to kind of pop culture and also so many references to different philosophical ideas, different concepts, um, and it's just so creative in that way. The second thing about it though is obviously the, the main book is about, well, can we even visualize a kind of post-capitalist world? Uh, or is capitalism seen as just the way life is? Um, and explores these in different ways and it's really kind of like it, it really for me it really explained the condition I was living in I uh, it it also pointed yeah like how it just seems so all in like all inclusive capitalism does um, and the book also has a particular attack on the way capitalism interacts with the individual and how that individual then relates to other people due to capitalism and I think it's a really good book for also kind of a more personal critique of capitalism um, relating to the individual rather than to the entire effects on the economy or like a, yeah maybe culture as it might be for other stuff all in all you, you have to read this though you, you just have to just go and read it there's a copy on on uh, Libcom uh, that you can go and read. It's probably got PDFs in other places on the internet. Um, I think there's even an audiobook coming out for it as well. So, you know, get on that. From reading, um, you know, uh, parts of capitalist realism and reading the whole thing, um, sections of it talked about Deleuze and Guattari. Now, that's time, at, now at this time, I'd also been watching quite a lot of uh, Kirk Philosophy's videos, um, what formerly known as Kirk Philosophy and, and Jonas Psyche. Um, and, and yeah, I was just starting to learn more about this Deleuze guy. Um, and then Kirk Philosophy came out with his, book, uh, with his video on postscripts on societies of control. And that just blew me away. And at the time I was, you know, obviously reading capitalist realism and I didn't really have any kind of theoretical view of looking at the world. I just knew that, I don't know, capitalism was bad in some ways. Particularly that was expressed um, in Mark Fisher's book. But also just kind of vague ideas. Um, I didn't really have any interpretation of the, the world in its entirety though. Uh, or, or in the kind of kind of historical kind of position we're in and um, and Kirk Philosophy came out with his uh, video that Deleuze had written about you know postscripts on society's control and that blew me away and I decided to then go and it's because I'd read about him before I decided to listen to uh, the podcast that philosophizes this the series that he'd done on Deleuze and that just absolutely like blew me away and I, I knew I'd want to be Deleuzean after that so um, I ended up buying um, Deleuze's Negotiations because this has the um, this has the essay on postscripts of societies of control uh, here at the back, as you can probably not see because it's probably blurry. But yeah, uh, I haven't read all of this, but I have read the uh, the letter to a harsh critic and kind of part one of it and I'm yet to read through all of it but reading through that was just oh that was that was so amazing um, I, I really really like really loved Deleuze um, yeah and, and so that's a particular um, book just because it signifies my larger kind of theoretical like journey and also um, reading Desert Islands and other texts, sections from that was also very enlightening, uh, as well as reading this. Um, yeah. Now I'd come to buy this book, um, 
thanks to the the friend who had taken my original copy of Capitalist Realism. Um, but he recommended this book because he reads tons of books and he's far more clever than me. And he recommended the book to me. And I mean, I wanted to learn more and remember more from books if I'm going to be doing a whole philosophy course on books. So I bought this at the start of the first year. And I only got to it during just the summer between the first and the second year, really. Um, but I've read, I've read through basically all of it. Uh, yeah, like apart from one or two chapters in part three, I've read through all of it really, and it's it's such a great book in my opinion. Um, it really um, it really gave me a lot more confidence in reading, um, and it essentially takes you on a guided tour uh, through all the different processes and stages you can do for learning uh, and reading. Um, and then when it, it it just shows you everything you need. Um, so it improved like improved my confidence tenfold in um, in approaching reading and believing that I can actually understand what these texts are saying. Um, I'm also doing a series on this uh, of however many parts, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to click on them probably in the description maybe if it's there at some point. Um, yeah. Later on in that same summer, I would uh, come to pick up um, Deleuze's book on Spinoza. His short one, because his long one looks quite uh, quite complicated. And again, I've only read probably about half of this, but I included this particularly because there was just, there was just one concept and one idea that I really really liked. Um, in the preface, Robert Hurley, I think that's him. Um, yeah, Robert Hurley, he talks about how Deleuze would say that we always approach things from the middle. Uh, we always approach them as they're in motion. And this uh, idea really uh, has really stuck in my head. Because it makes a lot of sense, you know, when, when we do um, kind of meet up with, when we do when we are introduced to new things, they're always changing. They were something and now they're becoming something other. Um, and it also explains how... Um, and, and so that's just good to think on its own. Um, but it also, like, explains how, no matter, like, it, it also gave me more of a confidence uh, that when going into new fields of, uh, like, work and thought, how you know, when you first go into it, oh, it's going to be really, um, it's going to be really hard to understand. But that's just because, you know, you don't know all the terminology. And so you're kind of entering into the middle of it, where you have to kind of search around, you have to know about all the different parts, and then once you know the meanings and how each of those meanings relate to one another, and the terminology of that field that you've gone into, uh, it can all make sense. And so it just gave me a lot more confidence. Um, when approaching books. And that's why it's here, because though it was just one sentence, it really like, changed how I think about things. Along that same time though, um, as I was reading that, I also picked up um, Hélène de Botton's uh, book, Consolations of Philosophy. Um, sorry, Boethius, you're not here. Um, you've been superseded. But um, this book... I bought because I wanted to have a bridge between my philosophical views and my mum's viewpoint. Uh, this was going to be a good book because my mum had watched a couple of School of Life videos and obviously I knew a lot of them. Um, and I thought it would really help her out because it would, yeah, it would give us something to share and talking about. Um, and so I bought the book for her originally but then I kind of read a bit of it and wanted it myself as well, so I also bought my own copy. And I've only really read the last two chapters, but the last chapter, the one on difficulty and the one on Nietzsche, is uh, is probably one that well, it was one that had a really big effect on how I think about difficulty in life. Um, and I think the way it was written, it it really changed my perspective, obviously, of difficulty. And it also made me far more open to reading Nietzsche. Um, 
and that's now influenced me later on as you will see uh, in a bit. The Deleuze Dictionary was another one. Um, I picked up this this year, uh, well this school year, um, and it's the only reason why it's here is just because it just gave me a fuller understanding of Deleuze. Um, I now feel after um, essentially like a year, uh, I know the vague outlines of Deleuze and maybe a couple of tiny bits of detail. I've still got so much more to like learn and cover, but I've read basically all of this, but it's a, it's a dictionary as it says, so you you can just flick between different parts of it. And I had a lot of fun doing that, learning all the different concepts and seeing how they connect to one another. Um, this is only here just because I needed it. Like, learning from videos is fun and all, but it doesn't give you a, a proper detailed understanding of the things that you're reading. The thing about reading is you have to be the active one. If you're watching a video, you just kind of have to sit there passively. And if, if you understand bits, that's okay. And if you don't understand it, you, you know, the time keeps on ticking on and you just forget about it. But if you're reading it, you have to be the one that physically gets through that book, well, mentally, really. And, uh, and yeah, and so this is here to say, you've got to read books. You, you have to do the reading. Um, and it certainly just, yeah, just gave me a more detailed view of Deleuze and also some of his work with Qatari. Moving back to Nietzsche though, um, obviously Deleuze was heavily inspired by Nietzsche and um, and reading that segment on uh, Hélène de Botton's book really made me open to um, kind of learning a bit more about Nietzsche. I, he's still obviously quite, well he's, he's still incredibly hostile to kind of leftist politics in a way but we can still use him, and we can still be quite Nietzschean. Um, many people, such as like Emma Goldman, were influenced by Nietzsche, and um, I think we can be Nietzschean in some ways, still today. Um, and so I picked up uh, Thus Spoke the Zarathustra, which is there, well, uh, there you go, about time, jeez. Um, and I've only I've only been able to get up to the end of part one before I start this university year. Or no, no, actually no, this second semester of the university year because I've read this over the holidays. Um, and it's I put this in here because it's more of a prediction towards the future. Um, I've only read part one of this, but I do think it's changing me kind of unconsciously in a way. Um, it's certainly making me more braver and more kind of more confident in myself really and for better or worse um, it's influencing me the last two books that I get to um, as you can see like it's heavily ramped up the, like closer we've got to now probably because I'm probably more just th these things are maybe closer in my head to being remembered but it's particularly uh, the Contradictions of Capitalism by uh, Lenny Flank. Now this book, the actual makeup of it is a bit strange. It's not really that like, it's not very well designed. Um, neither does it have any citations in. So I can't really properly recommend this book. Um, but from everything that I've learned in other areas, it, like everything else backs up what this says. And this essentially con uh, kind of contracts a lot of Marxist theory and a lot of Marxist ideas in different various fields, such as uh, ideas in imperialism, um, unequal exchanges between countries, um, the historical conditions that give rise to different kind of uh, well, historical kind of states such as feudalism and capitalism and monopoly capitalism in particular um, and, and it also covers um, it covers a lot of what he calls the Leninist or as they're sometimes called like state socialist countries and how he argues that they had internal contradictions that still followed capitalism 
which led to that kind of um, breakdown. And so this was just a great book, just because it, it went over all of the fields in a sort of, uh, well, in, in a very basic brush, but it still covers all of the fields. Um, and it was really good to read it because of that. it gives you a wider kind of paintbrush and, and it connects a lot of the different dots. Um, and I particularly, uh, particularly also put this down because it discusses how kind of Marx saw this uh, society as being socially reproduced. And I hadn't thought about that concept. I'm sure it's in other Marxist texts, or well, I mean it is, but it really like, it made me think about, yeah, kind of cultural effects, such as like hegemony, um, and also the relations these things have to, down to like patriarchy and racism and all those things. And uh, yeah, that's it. The, the most the most recent book um, is, that I've read that has had an effect. Well, it, it's probably been there was another book, um, but I'll put I'll I'll talk about them in the honourable mentions. But it was probably um, a wage, labour, and capital value, price, profit by Karl Marx. Um, this is the first Marxist text that I've properly read. I haven't read the Communist Manifesto or any of those. Um, and because I, I mean, I didn't. I've, I've bought Capital, but obviously, I uh, I don't want to read it. You think I'm going to read that? I will do at one point, but it was a bit daunting. So I'd rather go with something that's a uh, a fifth of the length and get some vague idea. Um, and it really helped explain the labour theory of value and um, the, a lot of the consequences that happen from production. And also from um, like increases in uh, efficiency and how that's under capitalism kind of actually quite bad. I put this here because it's just it's just developed my views far more, and it's also made I think it's also probably made my like my view like I've been far more serious and I want to be far more rigorous with my learning of kind of leftist politics and. I think that's down to the book. Like, there's only so many videos you can watch online that do that, and um, yeah, and I, I, for me at least, and I can understand if there are people that can't read books. Um, that's completely fair enough. But for me, I, I mean, I have a really crap attention span. But for me, it was just really, really helpful to actually properly read books because it, it actually. I feel like I'm far more serious. Um, I'm far more focused in the questions I'm asking and how I'm thinking about how things that relate to one another in politics now. And nowadays I follow kind of. I watch people more like um, Zoe Baker, uh, Red Plateaus, still follow uh, Jonas Syker. Um, I also watch Paul Morin, a um, little bit of Hakim. Um, Little dabbles in Vosh, um, and, and many, many other, you know, leftist creators, uh, and still older people as well. But um, that's just how my politics has changed, really. Some on honourable mentions would be uh, Albert Camus' *The Outsider*, uh, *What Is Anarchism* by Donald Room, uh, *Make Rojava Green Again*, um, Plato's *Republic*. Um, Voltaire's uh, Candide, Ways of Seeing uh, by John Berger, A Rebel's Guide to Rosa Luxemburg by Sally Campbell, This Is Not a Drill by uh, Extinction, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Descartes' Meditations, The Lie of Global Prosperity by Seth Donnelly, and, uh, and Why I'm Not Talking to White People About Race as well. Um, another one I'd also mention is probably, do we need economic inequality? But yeah, uh, so that's just all of the things that have influenced me at the moment. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's it, really. Uh, so I hope you got something out of this. I hope that some of this is interesting. And uh, I just hope you have a nice day, really. See you.